Sabres insider, Paul Hamilton, joining me now. Uh, Paul, um, a lot of things to talk about, but things that we have talked about before. Um, any updates uh, recently on A, the coaching situation, and B, uh, the Jack Eichel situation, the two heavy hitters of this offseason so far? Well, the Rick Tockett tour has been going to a lot of cities. Uh, we talked about last week him going to Seattle, uh, which he did. And then uh, there's supposedly going to be a stop in Columbus. So there supposedly was a stop in Buffalo this week, I think on Thursday. So, you know, that's somebody that they had spoken with. But again, you know, there are a lot of different types of coaches he wants to talk to, whether it's NHL coaches, whether it's NHL assistants, whether it's AHL coaches, whether it's college coaches. You know, so there's a bunch of different people that he'd like to talk to to get their ideas, uh, what they feel would be a good situation. And a lot of what he wants to do, too, is to pick people's brains, even if he doesn't hire them. You know, just listen to what they have to say as they talk about this team and get some other opinions that, that you can sit there and chew on. And, and so it's not necessarily, well, we're, we're just going to sit there and talk to a guy and he, he either he is or he isn't. I think they want to hear different things as they go along too about their team, whether this is a guy that's going to coach the team or not. Do you still have confidence in Don Granato with um, some of the candidates that they've been bringing in? Oh, I do. Um, college coaches, for whatever reason, just don't tend to be successful in the NHL. I mean, I won't say every college coach doesn't do well, but most of them don't. And they're the top college coaches that get into it. You know, even Herb Brooks, who was considered a, a genius coach, wasn't great in the National Hockey League. Um, Quinn just got fired in uh, with the New York Rangers after he was Jack's coach at BU and did well there, played for the national championship there. Montgomery had problems, you know, with Dallas. He was a, a, a big time coach in college. I believe it was at Denver. So, you know, they, there have been college coaches that have gone through, but for whatever reason, they don't tend to be all that successful in the National Hockey League. So I don't know if I would like going the college route. I know, you know, there, there's, there are coaches that they would like to at least talk to and look at, uh, whether it's UMass's coach or Providence's coach or a Minnesota Duluth's coach. I mean, those are guys that have been winners there, but at least he wants to pick their brains and speak to them. And obviously the Eichel situation is a big one. If he does stay, I mean, Jack Eichel has had so much say of what goes on in this organization since he's been here. Um, do you think they give him any kind of say in this head coaching search? No, not stay? at all. I, I think he was asked his opinion on Granado, as were, it seemed like most of the players were, even the young guys. I think we're asked their thoughts on Don Granado and what they learned and where, where they feel things are headed. So I, but I think that wasn't just ask of Jack or Sam. I think it was asked of most of the players, especially more veteran type players to see, you know, how they feel about it, how they feel they're going. So at least Adams can take the temperature of the room and, and understand how people feel. But I think that would be the only input, especially since, you know, there's so much, unknown in Jack Eichel's situation I don't think they're going to go run into him to say well what do you feel about this coach do you like this coach or whatever and obviously things have been very quiet with the team lately as we'd expect um right now have you heard anything about Jack in the past week yeah that should come to a head either this this week or the week after that's the timeline that was laid down by uh Adams and so they're, they're doing the rehab process. The rehab process should end either right at the tail end of May, which we're approaching, or the very beginning of June. That's when they get together. They try to figure out, okay, the doctors look at it. What is the rehab done? And probably testing that needs to be done, probably imaging that needs to be done. And then they look at it and see how, where have we come? Has this improved? Has it not improved? What would the next step be? After that decision were to be made, then Adams and the doctors would get together with Eichel and his representation, whether doctors would be involved, his agent definitely would be there. And they would tell him their thoughts. If they were any more comfortable with Jack's thought on surgery, uh, if they felt surgery was necessary, but they don't want to necessarily go with what Jack is talking about, 
maybe some different type of surgery if no improvement has been seen. So that's when those talks would go. And if Jack's not happy with that and still would like to have the uh, disc removal and then replacement, then he would be able to go to arbitration through the collective bargaining agreement. He would have 60 days to do that. It would then go to a panel and then you know arbitration would happen there and then you would go from there. Now, if he didn't like that, he could always ask to be traded or, you know, use that route, which he has not done yet. But th that's what's coming up here. And it should be either right at this week or the beginning of the week after that they have these discussions and then try to move forward and come up with a better solution or a, a, maybe a new plan would be better for what they want to do. And um, Kevin Adams told us uh, this surgery that Jack Eichel's camp wanted him to have has never been done uh, successfully on an NHL player before. What do you understand about this surgery? And is, is, it, is it as risky as the Sabres front office has led us to believe? Well, Julianne, I, I don't know. I think that's the thing. I think you just hit the nail right on the hair that they don't know if it's risky. Because as you just said, it hasn't been performed on a National Hockey League player. It's been performed on, uh, you know, some boxers and fighters and that type of thing. But that's all new, too. And it wasn't done that long ago. So they don't have long-term results to look at. They have short-term results on other athletes and other sports. So that's where I think the comfort level is. And I, I can't imagine, even if the Sabres doctors say, well, we're not getting anywhere. This has not gotten any better with the rehab. It, it, they might want a different type of a surgery. I don't know why they would get all of a sudden more comfortable with a surgery that has never been performed on an NHL player has been pretty new. And, you know, I, I suppose you could have, you could have waivers signed. And if, if it went sideways, then you wouldn't, the Sabres wouldn't be held responsible, you know, paying the contract or, you know, right. those types of things. You could probably do all that. Uh, that would get pretty messy too. Uh, yeah, but, is that uh, even something Jack Eichel and his agent would do? Yeah, I, I don't know if they would sign the waiver or not, unless they just believe so strongly, so strongly that, yeah. that they say, all right, we'll sign a waiver and then still be upset about it. And then in the end, we'll end up asking to be traded anyway, because you know they didn't like the way they were treated and they didn't see a future. So, um, and as I mentioned, that has not happened yet. I mean, they've been all right, we'll, we'll do it your way. They have to. That's what the contract says. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so they have to do it that way. But, you know, I, I think you can understand, as can I. I mean, I, I kind of see where the Sabres doctors are coming from here, not having a comfort just because there's nothing to gauge it on. Yeah, and there's obviously a, a huge risk there. And then, um, you know, Eichel, even as a trade chip or as if he's going to move forward in this organization, then – you're in pretty big trouble if things don't work out and you know you're you don't protect yourself as an organization there uh i want to move on to the stanley cup playoffs uh you like the boston bruins and they, uh you know a lot of overtimes with the washington capitals but they really got their footing late in that series against them and were um able to take them down in five games were, were you surprised how i don't want to say easily they were able to handle the capitals because there were so many overtimes but how quickly they got it done you know what there were overtimes but i still thought boston even the overtime games were the better team mm -hmm. i almost might say by far it just wound up going to overtime and and you know they find i just did thought they would get more resistance from the capitals in this series even though there were overtime games that Boston won after game one. So as you know, when we talked, uh, I thought Boston probably would be the team that would come out of this division. They still have to beat the Islanders, which is no easy task. I did pick the Islanders to beat the Penguins in six, actually. Um, and basically for the Penguins, it just boiled down to goaltending. I mean, their goaltending yeah. let them down and, and the Islanders didn't. Their goaltending was superb. A rookie stepped into the net, won four of the six games that yeah. were played. He was 4-0. Oh. Barlamov was only Probably should have been in there the whole time. He should have been, especially if he stole game one. I thought the Penguins should have won game one, and I thought Sorokin was the reason. Yeah. You know, Jari at one end and Sorokin at the other was the only reason the Islanders won that game. The Islanders got better as the game went on, but I still thought that was the Penguins game. 
And after Sorokin does all that, makes some phenomenal saves, totally outplays Jari. Then he sits the bench for the next two. Yeah. Uh, I was just a little bizarre there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and it, and for the Islanders, they wound up losing those two games, so that's why Sorokin wound up going back in, and he wins three in a row. But I don't think I ever would have taken him out of the net in the first place. Yeah, and uh, with the um, East final coming up, do you still like the Bruins? I'm assuming. Yeah, I think this is going to be a hard fought one. You know, it wouldn't shock me if this went to seven games. Um, you know, I, I think these two teams match up really well against each other. If Sorokin continues on the road, he is. Even if Varlamov gets in, he's a good goalie. So I think both teams are probably going to get good goaltending. Rask from the Bruins and either yeah. guy from the Islanders, but Sorokin's the hot hand right now and has certainly shown – that this situation is not too big for him. Uh, the Islander defense, some people wouldn't even know the names of the Islander defense, but they're good. Yeah. Those guys are good. They've got guys who can add to the offense. They're really good on defense. Ask Sidney Crosby in his line, uh, a couple of how good defensively some of the Islanders are, uh, you know, as far as the defense goes. And, uh, you know, they had trouble getting points on the board and it was because of some of the defensemen that were playing for the Islanders. So, you know, they're obviously are going to have to a big task with the Bergeron line and the Creechy line. Yeah. There's yeah. two lines that are going to be coming at them hard. So, you know, they're going to have to figure out a way, especially with that Bergeron line to shut that down and be able to let their guys who can put the puck in that. Don't forget a big part of the New York Islanders is their captain Anders Lee. I was just about to bring up Anders Lee. How surprised are you that they've been able to play so well without him? I think that's just a testament to it's, maybe the Islanders aren't the most talented team out there, but they're a team. Right. They play yeah. as a team. I mean, they could maybe be the best team without having the best talent with the way they formed this team. You know, you get Anders Lee. Josh Bailey is a phenomenal passer. You know, I, I don't think he gets enough credits. Look at some of the goals he set up against the Penguins with just some pinpoint passing that wound up putting pucks almost into an empty net that Jari didn't even have a chance on just because of the beautiful passing that he did. And, of course, Barzell, his, he speaks for himself. Hmm. But I think Bailey has actually outplayed Barzell so far in the playoffs. And, you know, he, he just doesn't get a lot of credit. I think, you know, some of the talent that they – you know, Eberle's on that team. Some of the talent they have on the team – they don't get enough credit for, but they also get contributions out of their lower lines to the Sezikis line. Not only are they hard to play against, but they can put the puck in the net from time to time. And they score good, timely goals that are important to the Islanders. And I, I don't love that. I, I tell you, if the Sabres could get a line like that, the Sabres would improve quite a bit. If they could get two guys to play like that line does. Well, they, they never really seemed rattled against the Penguins at any point. Um, but does, is it Barry Trotz really steering the ship here? Like you say, they're, you know, possibly the best overall team, the way that they play together. Is that because of Barry? Oh, definitely. Well, it's because of Lou Lamorello. If you're, if you're going to coach a Lou Lamorello team, you are going to coach a certain way. So before Barry Trotz was hired, it was understood this is the way they're going to play. I don't think Lou Lamorello liked it all the way the Toronto Maple Leafs played. That's probably why he didn't want to stay there. You know, and it's the only team that he's ever been associated with doesn't play that tight type of play. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have a bunch of superstars on it. They sometimes have some, but uh, over the years. But, you know, that's the way he wants a team composed and that's the way he wants to do it so it just shouldn't matter who's in net it shouldn't matter in this situation you know we all should be able to handle it is is the philosophy his he has and i remember barry trotz the calder cup finals barry trotz was coaching the portland pirates and john tortorella was coaching the rochester americans and rochester actually won that series i, I had an opportunity to do some games in that series but uh, two very good coaches that wound up in the NHL went at it in the AHL and had a, a really – so that was the, really the only time I saw Trotz maybe a little bit uncoached. Once he got to the NHL, you don't yeah. see that much anymore. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you uh, – just quickly, um, what do you think about Torts and uh, where he can end up? I don't know. 
Don't you think that he just is a little too abrasive for, for what the Sabres need right now? I, and I know John very, very well. I mean, we, we joke around when I see him and, and uh, he was an assistant in Buffalo, as I said, won the Calder cup with Rochester. Uh, so I know John very well and, and I know how he works. I know how he thinks, but the problem is, you know, well, look what happened to Columbus. Their best players wanted out. They didn't yeah. want to deal with yeah. him anymore. And it's like, well, too bad. You would say he's the coach type of a thing. But when you're losing guys that you're drafting in the top three uh, and, and, you know, the, they don't want to play there anymore. And guys, you know, Panarin didn't want to. So he left in free agency. And, uh, you know, they've lost some very good hockey players. So there was a time I thought maybe the game had passed John by, but I don't believe that anymore. I think he's caught back up again and, and has changed some of his tactics. But I just wonder how those tactics would go over in the Sabre room as maybe compared to Don Granato, who I, I don't know if you agree. But I, yeah. <laughs> He's a lot of gentle, but he is tough when he has to be, I think. Yeah. yeah. He's, he showed me I had the wrong impression of him. I thought maybe he wouldn't be tough enough. And I thought he was, you know, I'm watching him at practice. Um, you know, th if things aren't done right, they're going to be done over. He seemed to be very honest with the players and said, this isn't going to go. We're going to do it this way because this is what we think you do best. If a player made a real bad mistake, like Tage Thompson took a real dumb penalty uh, near the end of a game, his ice time for the next two or three games. I don't even know if he got six minutes in those games. Right. right. I, I remember him talking about that and he said Tage was so mad, but he got it. He understood. Yeah, he remember him talking about, yeah, remember yeah. Talking about cousins too. He goes, yeah, well, I had yeah. Cousins out against the Crosby line for one game. And then the next game, we decided not to do that. And he goes, Dylan was really mad. <laughs> yeah. he, he seemed like he was happy that Dylan was mad. He should be. Uh, you know, Dylan right. should be mad because he wants that responsibility. Right, right. And um, back to the postseason, um, Leafs and Habs tonight. Um, what are your thoughts with the uh, Montreal forcing a game six here, if this goes to a game seven tonight, is Toronto in trouble? Beginning the series, I wouldn't have been surprised with six games, but the way the series was unfolding, now mm -hmm. I am surprised it got to a sixth game. I didn't think it would. Um, yeah, any team could get in trouble. You're absolutely right. Any team could get in trouble when uh, you, you wind up in a game seven, it's a free for all and it's, it's shown it doesn't matter if you're home or away the away team i think it's like 50 50 who wins a game seven i mean teams fight all the time for all right we need home ice advantage we got to have that home ice advantage and then the playoffs are played and the visiting team wins wins 50 percent or more of the game sometimes anyway so yeah. uh yeah i definitely agree with you that uh, the 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 leafs could be in trouble if they allow montreal to stay in the sea they got to do what vegas did finally you know, in game seven, Vegas didn't let Minnesota up off the mat. Even when Minnesota scored a goal, you know, to get back in the game, they really weren't in the game if you were watching it. I mean, yeah. Vegas was all over them. And Vegas just, hey, we're, we've had enough. You've scared us enough. We're just not going to let you off the mat. And I think Toronto has to be have that mindset in game six because game seven is, is anything can happen. What do the Leafs need to do tonight? Um, and it's going to be a great environment, too, in Montreal because there are fans in Canada again. Yeah. I don't know if, those, if enough. I mean, that's yeah, an arena. Is it, gonna, that's, uh, is it going to make a difference? Who knows? But, I'll tell uh, you what. If, if you can ever get up there for a game, get up there for a game. It, it, is, <laughs> it is a real experience. Those fans, how loud they are, how knowledgeable they are. It really, even the arena, the, the, the ambiance, if you can ever get there, it's such a great place to watch a hockey game. So even though there aren't going to be a lot of fans in there, they may be able to make a difference because it's Montreal. Yeah. But it also, they can make a difference the other way too. Like I always, anytime you say keys to the game when the Sabres at Montreal, get a fast start because you will turn those fans on that team in no time. I mean, if you play the first 10 minutes and you're all over the Canadians, those fans are all over the Canadians too. So, uh, you know, it could turn bad if the Leafs go out to a two nothing lead or something like that. It could be the opposite effect on the Habs. So for Americans keeping track at home, uh, a little bit of a French Philly vibe then. 
<laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, what does, uh, besides get out to a tough lead, what, what does Toronto need to do tonight uh, to win this game and just end it? One thing they were getting early in this series was goaltending, which they haven't gotten in the playoffs since we've been alive. I mean, even when Curtis Joseph played, I mean, he, you know, he played pretty well for the Leafs at times, but when it got right down to it, he couldn't get them through. So goaltending has been, I mean, they paid a first and a second round pick to get Anderson and Anderson's given them some good games in the regular season, but he has not been good in the playoffs and notice he's not in that anymore. They pick up Campbell from the Kings. And then they, that's why I think they were beating the Canadians because they were getting good goaltending. So I think, you know, that's going to be a real big key that, you know, the goaltending can't let them down again like they have against the Bruins yeah. for how many years now in a row where they lost to the Bruins in the first round. Uh, Golting was, it was a huge key to that. And they were way ahead in some of those series too, and still couldn't get by. So I think that's going to be a real big key, you know, Campbell really doing what he's been able to do since he's become a Maple Leaf. And uh, if Toronto does get out of this alive and, and maybe if, even if it is the Habs, um, could we possibly um after the north wraps up and it's one of these two te- if it is one of these two teams could we see playoff hockey in buffalo absolutely year? i mean you now it depends when the border is going to open and that's still a series away you know either montreal or toronto has to play winnipeg and if winnipeg were to win i would think they would probably wind up in arizona or minnesota or north dakota or someplace like that but there's been a lot of talk that if the toronto maple Leafs win the north that they will play in Buffalo. You know, that will be their home. Just like the Raptors home was in Tampa. The Blue Jays home is in Buffalo. And there's talk, especially when you got a hotel, oh, a practice yeah. rink. Yeah. The amenities are there. Absolutely. So uh, Buffalo would have a pretty good chance to see some playoff hockey. If Toronto was not able to stay home and the border is not open and they couldn't, they would have to move. I think Buffalo would stand a very good chance of seeing some playoff hockey. Well, we'll see how it all unfolds. Paul Hamilton, thanks so much for joining me.